little over 30 years after Fillmore left the White House, another president from Buffalo moved in. Few political careers have risen faster than Grover Cleveland's did in the 1880s. In a span of just over three years, he went from Mayor Cleveland to Governor Cleveland to President Cleveland. My intense feeling of responsibility impels me to invoke for the manifold interests of a generous and confiding people the most scrupulous care and to pledge my willing support to every legislative effort for the advancement of the greatness and prosperity of our beloved country, President Grover Cleveland. In a world of uh, you know, phonies and scam artists, uh, he was just a straight shooter who had integrity and honesty and uh, you could trust him. He did what he said he was going to do and uh, he just sort of naturally rose to the top. He was, the rumor or legend has it, he was in a bar having a beer when they said, hey Grover, run for mayor. I mean, he was the guy, he was not the guy who sought office. He was the guy that other people in your community went to to save the city and he, and he did. The city was very corrupt at that time and he really, he really, uh, he was, he was a, a reformer of his day. A reputation Cleveland took to Albany and then Washington. Grover Cleveland, as a matter of fact, um, as, as governor of New York, managed to set aside the first state park, uh, that was the Niagara Falls Reserve, followed by the Adirondacks. It became the prototype for the national park system. Uh, and as president, when he took a look at the alleged land sales out west, um, he thought that there was some funny business going on and of course he, his reputation was as a scrupulously honest man and he got back 81 million acres of land that had been fraudulently transferred back into public lands. Something happened in Cleveland's first year in the White House that still hasn't been matched to this day. He is the only president to be married in the White House. The Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society still has a piece of the groom's cake. The Blue Room was the site of the ceremony where Cleveland married Francis Folsom, his junior, by 27 years. 22 years old, Francis Folsom was a, a gorgeous first lady, one of the most popular first ladies of the 1800s, probably only second to you know, Dolly Madison. In this day and age, uh, if a president would have a 22-year-old wife, it probably would not go over well. But back then, it wasn't much of an issue. Folsom actually became enormously popular with the American public. Cleveland's political team, realizing this, put her face on numerous campaign paraphernalia. But even with the addition of his new bride, it wasn't enough to get him re-elected in 1888. Much like Al Gore in 2000, Cleveland won the popular vote, but lost in the electoral count. Benjamin Harrison was now president. The story was that his wife said, uh, take care of the furniture because we're going to be back in four years. And that's exactly what happened. In 1892, Cleveland again ran against Harrison and this time won the popular and electoral vote. And from the looks of it, made for an awkward carriage ride between the two on Inauguration Day. Grover Cleveland is the only president to serve non-consecutive terms. You lose a presidential election today, your chance of a comeback is almost nil. So how did Cleveland do it? His integrity and honesty, uh, there's never a hint of, of corruption. Uh, he, did, he, he did what he said he was going to do. He was an able party leader. A good analog would be somebody like Bill Clinton. Uh, we think of the Democratic Party today as having a Clinton win. And in the late 19th century, there was a, a Cleveland wing of the Democratic Party. His second presidency happened to coincide with the first Great Depression in U.S. history. Um, before the Great Depression of the 1930s, this was called, in fact, the Great Depression. And Cleveland's economic policies, whether or not they were directly responsible, Cleveland's policies did not help the country to get out of the Depression. So he did leave a mixed legacy. His success was as a party leader and organizer. Um, his failure, if you want to put it that way, was in not responding adequately to changing economic conditions. Jim Ostrowski is hoping to fix up this old library in Buffalo and turn it into the Grover Cleveland Presidential Library. One does not currently exist honoring the 22nd and 24th president, but Ostrowski hopes that will soon change. This is a good location, um, about the right size for a, a smaller uh, uh, presidential library, which, which Grover would have been happy about because he was notoriously stingy. 
in spending uh, government money. And uh, uh, he, he, he uh, is a very modest guy, he's a middle class guy. I don't think he would want a big monument to himself, but I think that uh, as his grandson saw this building, he said, I think this is about right, or something that, uh, or the right size for, for Grover, uh, big enough to uh, make the point. We want to bring Grover back to life because he has a lot to offer uh, America today.